Hi, I'm Stefan Karpinski. Uh, I'm going to do something unusual for PyData, which is talk about a different language, not Python. Um, although I think that you know my experience with the Python community is that everybody's really inclusive and they're interested in results. Um, so everybody's been super cool. Um, we actually just joined NumFocus, which was previously an entirely Python group for like scientific computing, uh, but now it's not. It's Julia too, and a couple of our projects have joined too. So Julia is a new, relatively new, high-performance uh, dynamic language for scientific computing. Um, yeah, sure. Where is the mic? Oh, the mic. I'm hold it up. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be awkward once I start coding, which is going to be most of my presentation. But I'll give it a try. Um, these, uh, at this point, the project is much bigger than this. We've got you know dozens of people who are contributing to the core language and even more people who are working on packages. We have like 400 something packages last I checked. Um, but we started this, the four of us started the project together back in 2009, um, although it's been public since like 2012. Um, so what's the deal with this language? Uh, so I'm going to talk about it with this pretty square as a sort of visual aid. Um, so I'm going to break down programming languages on two dimensions. Uh, so pure and impure, so if anybody's programmed in like Haskell, right, Haskell is the prototypical pure language where you try to avoid side effects and mutable state. Uh, impure languages are like, you know, Python and C where you can assign to global variables and have side effects and do all that kind of jazz. Uh, there's also languages where you talk about types, like, you know, C, you put type annotations on things. Haskell also talks about types. Um, languages where you don't talk about types. So, you know, I've mentioned Haskell a couple of times. C belongs up there. Uh, Lisp is sort of the original language that is impure and doesn't talk about types. You just sort of have values, they float around. The, the types of the things in your program are defined by the code itself. How the code applies to the values is, is what happens. That gives you the types. Um, I thought about trying to find something in this corner. The only thing I can think of that doesn't talk about types and is pure is the lambda calculus. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the only thing I could think of putting in that corner. So where on this diagram does Julia fit? Well, Python, first of all, is in the, in the Lisp corner. In fact, all of these like, high-level tools for doing data analysis, numerical programming, all firmly in this impure, don't talk about types corner. Um, Julia is a little bit weird in that it's in the talk about types corner. We decided that, you know, let's, let's actually have a way of talking about types. Largely because we looked at NumPy and other systems, and the first thing you do, NumPy is basically a, a system for typed arrays in Python, right? So the first thing you did when you wanted to do high performance numeric, numerical stuff is add some way of mentioning types and talking about them. Um, so why not just build it into the language? There's another dimension that I couldn't do in three dimensions because I'm not that good of an artist, and this is in Keynote, um, which is static versus dynamic. Uh, and this is also a little unusual. Usually, if you talk about types, you're static. If you don't talk about types, you're dynamic, and that's just the way it breaks down. We're bucking the trend by being above the line here and yet being a dynamic language. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you know, where you're sort of exploring the design space and seeing, you know, like, what happens if we uh, keep the convenient parts of being dynamic, but we also allow you to, like, express the fact that an array is, you know, only contains floating point numbers, something like that. Um, so I'll get back to that slide in a second. But let me just show you a little bit what I'm talking about. And here is where the mic thing is going to get awkward. Oh, you have a, oh, perfect. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to define a vector of, you know, numbers. It's pretty straightforward. Oh, that thing's getting real snugly with me. Yeah, all right. Um, it's pretty straightforward input syntax. I think everybody should be pretty comfortable with that. Uh, what's a little bit different when you print it out, two things. One, first of all, it's printed vertically. That's because we like doing linear algebra. And one-dimensional objects are vectors, which are columns. So we print things vertically. We printed things horizontally for a while. It led to no end of confusion. We changed it. And everything got better. Um, also, you'll see that it says a three-element array of int 64. So that means that you actually have this type. You know that this thing contains only int 64s. Um, in fact, so let's see, you know, we can change the initial value of it, v to zero, okay, you know, that's totally fine. What happens if we do something like, 
whoa, wow, we changed V altogether. That's totally allowed. So it is still a dynamic language. Let's get back V here. Okay, you can't actually do that. Convert, uh, you can't convert an ASCII string to an integer. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, it could be kind of inconvenient. What happens if you do, for example, uh, you know, 1.0, you want to do that. That works fine, converts it for you. Okay, um, so the key thing that's different here, and if you've, you've used NumPy, you're like totally familiar with this already. Um, the layout of this thing is the way NumPy would do it, and the way C would do it, and the way Fortran would do it. It is not the way Python does it with normal arrays, because it has to store everything as a point, uh, an array of pointers. Because you can stick anything in a Python array, which means you have to have an array of pointers and then like individual heap allocated objects. So that is very convenient, but it's terrible for performance and it's terrible for memory. So that's one of the first things you want to do with types. But while we were at it, we decided let's get a little bit more leverage out of our type system. So I am going to switch over to the slides again. All right. Multiple dispatch. This is the core paradigm of the language. Um, now, you know, you're familiar with Python and with Java, which are single dispatch uh, OO languages with classes. Julia's not like that. It's, in some ways, it's a little bit more intuitive for like an old school programmer. Like my dad can't wrap his head around object oriented programming, but he can write his own postscript files uh, by hand. <laughs> so this I can explain to him, oh, oh, I've tried and it just doesn't go in. Like he can't, he doesn't get it and he's fine with that. Um, multiple dispatch is, is it's dispatch, so it's like, you know, when you write x dot, uh, you know, a dot f of b and c and it dispatches on the actual type of a, it's like that, but for all the arguments. Um, it's multiple because it's on all the arguments. So one of the, like, syntactic differences is that you write things like, you know, old school function application, f of a comma b comma c, instead of writing a dot f of b comma c. One of the ways we kind of, like, glibly talk about this is that it is not a dot oriented language. Um, which is good and bad. Like being able to write a dot and then tab complete things is actually really pretty awesome. But we've figured out that you can just write f of parentheses and then hit tab and start tab completing too. So it's not quite as convenient, but it works. Key point is it is not the same thing as method overloading. You guys aren't C++ programmers, so I'm not going to go into that too much. Um, well, let me, let me actually demo this and show, so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, all right. Okay, so eh, I was trying to decide what, how I should do this. I'm, I'm actually going to do this. Um, so I'm going to decide define a function called colots, and what it is going to do is it's going to define say k equals zero, and then while n is greater than one, it's going to say n equals is odd n 3n plus 1. Uh, I'm going to use this shift stuff because I can, and I'll explain what it is in a second. And then I'm going to increment k, uh, and then at the end I am going to return k. Okay. So this is function definition. It, Tabs don't matter, it's it, like indentation isn't significant. It's a little bit, looks a little bit like MATLAB or maybe Ruby. Um, some people like it, some people hate it. Uh, what this does is it does this procedure where you count up, you basically count how many times this thing, how many times this loop iterates. Um, and the crazy thing about this is if anybody has ever heard of the Colots conjecture, it is unknown but conjectured that this will always terminate, but nobody knows. And uh, it's actually possible that this is completely independent from the axioms of normal mathematics and we can't prove it either way. Um, which I just think is kind of fascinating. It's irrelevant to here. You can just see how a function can be defined in Julia now. Um, so, you know, you can see that it, 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 you know, we can compute a bunch of Colot's numbers n for n equals 1 through 100. This is, you know, array comprehension syntax. We print it out with some nice ellipsis. Uh, it seems pretty fast, but who knows? 100 isn't a very big number. Uh, but, you know, we can do a lot of them very quickly. 
Right? If you keep adding zeros, eventually something takes a while, but, um, but apparently not, not that long. Um, so one way we can sense, get a sense of how fast or efficient these things are is that we can actually see the, we use LLVM for code generation. Um, and you can see the LLVM code that is run for this. Well, that's, it's a little bit large. You can kind of see it, but it's not very much. Um, the native code you can also see. And you can see that that actually like fits on, in, on a single screen at this like ridiculous resolution. So that, let me, let me get it down to the point where you can actually, come on, come on, you can do it. There we go. All right. Okay, so that's the entire function body in x86 assembly. Um, so it is actually really, really fast. Uh, note that I did not mention a type anywhere. So this is sort of going against my point. So one of the things about static languages is they kind of tend to make you talk about types. We wanna let you talk about types, but not make you talk about types. So why would you want to talk about types? So I already mentioned the array thing, but you know, for example, let's say what happens if we do colots of 1.5. Ah, all right, well that's a bummer, that doesn't work. It says is odd float, it doesn't know how to tell you if a floating point number is odd. Okay, that's fine. Uh, colots of 1.0 kind of works, but that only works because it never gets to the is odd thing. Uh, colots of 2.0 doesn't work though. So okay, let's say we want to like try to make this thing work for floating point numbers. Um, what we're going to have to do is actually go back to this definition and say, ah, okay, I'm going to annotate this and I'm going to say that this actually only works if this guy is an integer. All right. So now, actually, let's restart the REPL. Uh, because it, it actually compiles the code only when it needs the integer version. So what happens is like I write, when I run colots 10, it's like, aha, you want to call this function on an integer because 10 is an integer. Oh, I gave it a 10. I gave 10 as the actual argument. So it said, oh, you, you're calling colots on this actual value. Um, if I had called it on something else, it would have, in fact, you know, I think, you know, uh, let's, uh, you can, uh, this, that's just a convenience thing for like, it's usually more convenient to just give it exact values. Um, you could, for example, call code LLVM colots, uh, you know, foo, uh, and it's gonna say no method. I don't, I don't know how to do that because I only know how to do it for integers because I restarted the REPL and defined it only for integers. So now we'll see that, you know, if we say colots foo, we get exactly that. Um, we also, yes? So is more Yes, very much so. Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we stole that motto from Python. Um, We've stolen lots of good things from Python. Python is a good language. Um, and you can see that it also doesn't work for floating point numbers. Um, but let's say we wanted to. We could just do, for example, colots uh, n, any real number, let's say. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna call the integer version on it by saying convert, let's say to the, you know, the int type, which is the sort of canonical, canonical machine-sized int. Type. We're going to convert into an int, in, the int type and then call it again. So now we get, you know, 10.0 and we get the correct version. Um, so what's happening here is that we're actually, we're overloading the colots function uh, with multiple methods. So this is very similar to sticking multiple, you know, method definitions uh, for different, you know, you have a super type and then you have a bunch of subtypes um, and each subtype defines the, like a colots method, for example. So you can imagine writing n dot colots parentheses uh, and then just having different subtypes like real, integer, whatever. Um, one of the key convenient things is that it's outside of the class definition. So I don't have to stick this colots thing inside of the integer type or anything like that. I can define it after the fact. Um, so that actually ends up being even more important, I think, than the multiple part of multiple dispatch is that there's external dispatch, um, which sep separate, you know, it's 
takes this idea of like sticking all the methods for a class inside of the type somehow and just separates it out. Um, for a type, uh, you may or may not be able to get some information this way. Uh, we, we support this more for uh, function. Oh, uh, well you can ask questions about it with, you know, question mark. Let's say you wanted to see uh, which definition is used for 1 plus 2.5. This at symbol thing I'm doing, those are macros. Um, and the reason you need a macro here is because you actually can't evaluate the expression to figure out what's going on first. You have to like look at the expression and be like, ah, you're calling plus on these two things. Let me look it up. Oh, control L. Um, edit will take you to the definition of that thing. So, uh, I don't know, how do I, I've been doing some string hacking lately, you can tell that I, okay, so let's, uh, let's try that again. There, you can see that this is the definition um, of how to add two numbers that we don't otherwise know how to add. Anyway, let's get to some Python Julia interaction goodness. Um, I could talk about multiple dispatch all day. Um, all right. So the first most obvious thing you want to do, there was a while, now we actually have a really good native Julia plotting package called Gadfly um, that's very ggplot2 inspired. But for a while, one of the best ways to do plotting in Julia was to use pyplot which is basically a, you know, it call, it wraps matplotlib and just lets you just do whatever you would want to do. So I'm going to do using pyplot. It actually takes longer than that, but I preloaded this. Um, I don't want to do false advertising here. So we define the Julia set function for two complex numbers. We do 80 iterations and, you know, this is the usual definition. Um, and we can, you know, define, let's see, uh, you know, this takes a little while, but not very long. I don't know. You know, it's one of those things where you're like, well, how, how fast is fast? Um, here's the LLVM code for it, which, you know, unless you meet LLVM code is, again, here's the x86 code. Uses a bunch of vector instructions and it's pretty fast. Um, but we want to look at it. So let's pick a gradient here. Uh, that one looks kind of, you know, Gothic, uh, and then we can use image show, which lets us use that gradient and like actually plot this whole thing. So image show is a function defined by the pyplot package, and it just displays this image for you. And you know, has it 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 tells you know it provides enough information so that I Julia. Oh, that's the other thing. We are already now seeing a Python Julia collaboration because this is I Julia which is IPython but with the Julia kernel. Um, which a couple of years ago, uh, Fernando Perez who created IPython invited us out to Berkeley to work on making a Julia kernel and we did. And this is the result and it's been pretty awesome to use. Um, it's a really, really great project. And it's called Jupyter now, right? So, um, and I think it's, Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. So those are kind of like the data analysis languages that they're targeting. Um, just, you know, to be fair to uh, the Julia side of things, I'm going to use this uh, compose thing, which is a, a image compositing library for, for Julia. And you can see that you can do kind of cool things like generate a Sierpinski gasket, and that was the code for it. It's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, this, I'm going to... Now, you know, you guys have all seen like cool interactive stuff, so I gotta also like have cool interactive stuff because, you know, keeping up with the Johnsons and all that. Um, and so that looks very similar to that other one, but in fact it is interactive because I can drag this slider and it changes the number of, the depth of the recursion for the, for the Sierpinski generation. Um, and you can see this is, this is very Mathematica inspired, if anybody's familiar with that. There's a manipulate form in Mathematica. Um, we have to use a macro because otherwise it would pre-evaluate everything, but you know, 
pretty pretty straightforward. You can see that it's not not hard. Um, this is the work of uh, Sashi Gouda, who was a phenomenal, phenomenal GSOC student. Um, so uh, it's not just images that you can do this with. You can also, this is an example of another package where Julie is calling Python, SymPy. Um, you know, SymPy is great. We're not going to duplicate all the functionality of SymPy anytime soon. So here, this is a little thing where you just create a symbol object X. Um, and then you do the same manipulate thing and you use SymPy's differentiate. Uh, and you can see that you can, up, one of the nice things about this is that you can see the methods of the sign function. Um, you know, there's a bunch of built-in ones that, you know, we know how to take, you know, the sign of a complex number, a real number, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you, it just added methods to the sign function, added a, a, a method for, for, the, for the symbol type um, and for an array of symbols, and that's all that's required. Now you can just use the sign function as is. Yes? The prefix? Oh, yeah, the prefix. So that is a syntactic sugar. So if you put a prefix in front of a string literal, it actually calls a macro that is uh, called at sim underscore string and then gives that the literal string contents of the string internals. So that way you can make custom string literals just by defining a macro. Um, we use that for like regular expressions and stuff. Uh, and you can see that you can you know, scan through the different levels of derivative of this. Yeah. Anyway, that's kind of fancy. Um, yeah, so again, this is the external dispatch thing. It's very nice. The fact that you can, like, add methods, define a new type sim, add methods to the existing built-in function without doing anything like monkey patching. Um, that's, that's kind of, kind of clean. Um, Uh, I'm actually not going to go through this multiple dispatch thing because I have more more interesting, cool things to demo. Um, so, yeah, let's. Uh, so I already demoed the colots thing. Um, this is sort of like the obligatory performance slide. So one of the reasons people are interested in Julia um, is because the performance is really good, and you could see, you know, the machine code is like it's tight, it's good. Um, but the, the benchmarks are also pretty good. This is a uh, time of execution for a bunch of really trivial benchmarks that test things like how fast are you at iteration, how fast are you at recursion, how fast are you at like shuffling a bunch of uh, you know integers and in an array. Um, logarithmic relative to performance of C. So you know we're kind of in this like between one and two times slower than C range. Uh, which is sort of where you know good compiled language implementations are. Uh, JavaScript is amazingly fast. Python is like a really good interpreter, right? So that's kind of the range it's in. Well, it depends on what part of it you mean. I don't know. So a lot of it is written in C, right? So C is fast, um, but the Key thing is that you have to write it all in C, whereas we get, we, we intentionally with these benchmarks and people have complained about it, do not write C and we also don't use vectorized code because we know, we already know that the vectorized code is fast because someone sat down and wrote the really fast C version. Um, so the real question is like, if I just write it, you know, the stupid naive version, how good is it? Which is not realistically what you would do, but you also wouldn't realistically compute Fibonacci numbers with double recursion because that's ridiculous. Um, remember that week where everybody was implementing like Fibonacci benchmarks like two years ago? That was really weird. Um, so anyway, it's fast. Uh, real, life, real life studies where people are doing like real data analysis and numerical computing have borne out that this is this like one to two X slower than C is kind of right as long as you're paying attention to the performance gotchas. Of which there are a few but they're not terrible. Type stability and don't mutate global variables is, are the two main things. Um, all right, so I'm going to do a little bit of calling. So I, I showed um, there, there's this great library called PyCall, which lets you actually just like import Python libraries and then just call them, which is how, Py, how PyPlot and SymPy are implemented. 
Um, but I'm also going to show you going the other direction. So starting up Julia, or starting up, sorry, Python, and calling a little bit of Julia. So uh, import Julia as Julia. Wait, no. Import Julia as Julia. And then jl equals Julia. Oh, yeah. I'm terrible at Python syntax. I'm glad there's. <laughs> I'm glad I'm in a room full of Python developers. Um, from Julia, import Julia. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, takes a minute to start up the Julia. This is loading the like lib dot Julia, lib Julia, which is a shared object file that just gives you all the like shenanigans inside of Julia. Um, so now you can do things like you know, call the Julia version of sign on 1.5 versus like, you know, uh, whatever the NumPy version is. There isn't a sign function, is there? No, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not going to. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so anyway, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, you know, let's say I felt like having this fast colots thing. We saw the code for that was really nice. Um, but I'm in Python, and I want that. So here's how you would do it. You can do jl.eval, and, oops. Well, I wrote it from scratch before, so I can do it again. Uh, k equals zero, while n greater than one, n equals is odd, and, and plus one, and okay. Uh, okay. All right, so hopefully that thing works and I didn't make some horrible, oh yeah, I don't have tab completion of file name, of path names, that's. I know, I know, I, I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> um, so, okay, so now we're calling the Julia thing that I just defined, um, which of course has, you know, the, uh, code native. Okay, we can see that again, because I just like showing that off. Um, Yes, you can, in fact. So, no, no copies. So it's shared memory, because the, the layout is exactly the same, right? C, Fortran, NumPy, Julia all have the same exact layout. Um, and so we don't have to do any copies. We just, we just share the exact same uh, memory. Um, you can wrap a pandas data frame object and like interact with it, uh, but there's no, I don't think we can do no copy sharing between pandas and, and data frames. We could with some work, but we don't currently. So I haven't actually done much work with Numba. Um, Obviously, one big difference is whether everything is compiled or not, um, which is both good and bad, right? Like, it's nice because I think sometimes it's sometimes you do have code where like just a kernel is all you really need to be fast. But there's also a lot of real, like real world code where you know there's the kernel, but then there's all the other shenanigans around it that also need to be fast. Um, and so having always having JIT compiled code that knows a lot about types is actually pretty helpful in those situations. Um, on the flip side, you know, you saw, I, well, I didn't actually demo it because I had preloaded it, but, you know, packages take a while to load. So especially the big sort of complicated ones like our plotting package gadfly takes, you know, at this point 30 seconds, um, which is a pain. Uh, we're working on pre-compilation of modules so that you would then not have to suffer through that, but, you know, for the moment it's awkward. It used to take 10, 15 seconds to start up Julia. Um, we fixed that by, again, pre-compilation. We actually pre-generate code and 
you know, you can start it up and it's, you know, it's like 10 times slower than Python to start up, which is not bad. Um, so I'm going to do one last interop stunt, um, which I'm going to define a uh, function called pyfib, which is going to take n, and then an unusual thing for a Fibonacci function, another function, which is going to be the Fibonacci function that it's going to call itself to do the recursion. Um, and then I'm going to say, if n is less than 2, just return n, else return uh, fib. So I'm going to call the function that we passed in as an argument on n minus 1, and then I'm going to pass it myself. And then n minus 2 and pi fib, like that. And um, all right, actually, I'm going to, I should have done this on the first line. I'm going to, oh, no, no, I, I messed it up. Yeah, all right. I'm terrible at entering Python code. Um, I'm going to print hi from Python. You'll see why this is interesting later. If n less than 2, this is like an exercise and everybody just watching me type. It feels slightly excruciating, but it's probably not that bad. Hopefully. Um, in case you didn't catch it the first time, here we go. Uh, all right, so there we go. So we got PyFib. Um, oh my God, I'm so used to things being able to. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I should. I, I just, I didn't. Okay, so we can compute the fifth Fibonacci number, is that correct? That seems wrong. <laughs> seems incorrect. It's okay. Is that actually true? No, it can't be. Oh, God, yeah. All right. Oh, weird. Okay. Well, we're just going to go with the, the fixed point. Okay. There, there, there we go. That's not a fixed point. Um, okay. So this thing works. Okay. Uh, now we're going to do the... Julia version of that, and you get to watch me enter this all over again. Um, yeah, all right. It doesn't really matter what we call this because we're going to return the function object. Um, okay. Okay, and then we're going to return n less than 2, n or fib n minus 1 uh, jl fib plus fib n minus 2 jl fib. Yes, so the last, this is like Lisp, um, the last expression in an evaluated is the value of something. Um, it's not, there are no statements. Everything is an expression. Um, which, yeah, makes macros a lot easier. Um, so now we're going to call this. We're going to call this on the, you know, on JLFib. And you can see, okay, we computed again, hi from Julia. All right, but here's the fun part. So now they're calling back and forth to each other across the language boundary between Julia and, and, uh, and Python. And you can see the like fun pattern. We can, of course, do it in the other direction, too. And we get the opposite pattern. Um, I don't recommend doing this, but the point is that <laughs> uh, you, you can, the interoperability, uh, interoperability is really high quality, and you can really seamlessly work with both Python and Julia from both directions. Um, so, more questions. People seem to have a lot of curiosity here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, so, the, the magic thing where you do the percent whatever should work, I don't know if it works right now. I feel like it used... The percentages don't work? No, 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that's a feature we need. Oh, I, you know, I think the discussion on that may have been that we could just do it with a macro or something. I don't know. But yes, that's probably a missing feature right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can easily do that. Um, so it's the same as in the, in the prompt. If you do that, you get a shell. And you can just do whatever you want. It says, I pressed semicolon. I realized it doesn't actually show. In iJulia, you also use a semicolon. Uh, so that shows you what's in my current directory. Um, Um, so you can also do import. So the way using works is that it actually does a soft, like late binding, soft sort of namespace import, which means that, for example, if I do, so if I start up a session, there is a predefined E, which is the constant E. But you know, obviously, you might want to use the letter E as a variable in your program somewhere. So what happens is, if you do E equals, you know hello, uh, I don't know why you do that, now that's what E is. And it doesn't complain about it. You can still get at the base E explicitly if you want to. Um, so this is a compromise between wanting to make really interactive work convenient because it's kind of annoying when you're trying to get work done and explore some data to have to be like, ah, I didn't import that. Um, and not breaking people's code. So um, if you want to, for example, uh, you know, explicitly do import uh, base.e, now e, it's going to complain about that. It actually lets you do it, but it's going to complain. Um, again, the permission thing, we're like, you know, okay, we're going to give you a warning that this is going to do something weird, but we'll let you do it anyway, as long as we can. Yeah, those are good. That's a good question. Um, so I think so. Th I think there's two two areas that come to mind off the top of my head. One of them is the built-in numerical linear algebra stuff. Is like I think at this point the best there is. Um, I think it's significantly better even than MATLAB at this point because um, you got a bunch of like got a, we got about like five old-time MATLAB programmers who have like been just going at it and making it as as nice as possible. Um, I don't, that, so that's one of the things. Uh, I can maybe do a little bit of demo of stuff with that. But the other thing is optimization. So um, in particular, linear optimization. So there's this package, well, uh, it's called jump, jump.jl. Um, let me zoom in a little here. So jump.jl, one of the nice things about, uh, we, we picked the .jl ending for all packages and it makes everything really easy to find in Google. Um, so this is basically a, a, a consistent API that uses metaprogramming to generate uh, problem examples for various backends and solvers. Uh, so, like, you know, if you've done numerical optimization stuff like Cplex, Coin, all of these things that are listed here, um, some of them are free, some of them are quite expensive. Uh, one of the nice things is you can express a problem and then swap out a solver with, like, a one-line change, which you, like, if anybody has tried using these things, it's a nightmare. They all have completely different APIs. You have to spend, like, you know, a week reading their API to figure out how to express any problem. So here you can just use this really nice high-level API um, and solve all of these kinds of problems. So I think optimization is a really strong area. Um, we are hoping 
there's a group of people who are working on probabilistic programming, MCMC kind of stuff, and I think that's not really there yet, but I think it's going to be really strong because the people who are on it are, are super good. Um, you might like Gadfly. Gadfly produces beautiful plots. Um, yeah, I know. It's true, it's true. Bo the Bokeh demo earlier was really impressive. I tried to install Bokeh, but it, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't get it to interact with iJulio well, so I couldn't demo that. But Gadfly produces, you know, sort of R style plots. These aren't even really that impressive. For actually, uh, I think we put a bunch of the good ones on our on our homepage. So these are all made with Gadfly. You can kind of see that, you know, it's in this crowd. Everybody's like, yeah, whatever. We've seen it all. <laughs> um, but yeah. Anyway. Um, cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks you all for coming.